big as they used to because I, when I look down now, I can't see it for some reason. <laughs> uh oh. How, ma how many of us have held on to something that is not good? Um, and we thought by held, holding on to it that we would be somehow have some power. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm not going to let it go because it's mine to hold on to. And it ends up eating us up from the inside out. I won't ask for a show of hands because it's part of the human condition. I could ask you the question and if we were all honest, we would just all raise our hands, right? When somebody hurts you, somebody hurts me, we hold on to stuff. And sometimes, whether we know it or not, we're kind of waiting for them to trip and then pounce, right? Even the nicest people in this room, we all have it within us to do that. Um, and I have to be real careful here, uh, but I get annoyed sometimes as a pastor um, or a chaplain, what, whatever I'm doing at the time, um, when uh, the rest of the world talks about my or our social IQ or cultural IQ. Um, and our culture pretty much accepts the fact that uh, you should be able to hold on to stuff when somebody hurts you and look for an opportunity to hurt them back. We don't talk about this stuff a lot, but it's there. It is there. Um, in fact, um, we all, I, in fact, some of you have told me stories about uh, the release that you have experienced when you finally just came, where God gave you the strength to just let some stuff go. Um, and uh, even myself and my, my own family, um, in a relationship with a church that was extremely unhealthy, and I didn't know it at the time, um, I went from holding a grudge, um, probably for a couple of years, to be honest with you. Um, then I went from that to just pure anger. Um, from anger, uh, then to pity. And that was a stage where God spoke to me in a way and said, be careful with your pity. Don't get too big-headed about your pity. Amen. And then God spoke to me in powerful ways. It's self-examination will help you move from pity to all-out grace. Yes. By the way, I'm not fully there yet. Um, I, and some of the pain is related to how my uh, children responded to what happened. And I've got to let some stuff go. Um, and I, but now I'm praying that it's not permanent damage. Permanent spiritual damage. Um, and I know, because some of you have talked to me, and I'll be honest with you, some of you have talked to me about other people, <laughs> which I would prefer to talk to the person themselves, but I know there's stuff represented in this church body of deep, deep hurt. Um, stuff that's happened in the past, maybe stuff that's going on right now. Um, when I read the scripture today, I want you to know that I'm with you. It's difficult to read it, and it's definitely difficult to live into it. Um, but I do believe that Jesus has a better way than we have for ourselves. Sometimes it just takes a little longer for us to figure that out. Um, and it's the issue of forgiveness. The parable of the unforgiving debtor. A story about forgiveness. Matthew 18, 
beginning with verse 21. And then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Let me stop just a moment. Does that mean 490 times? Is that what Jesus means? No. Um, when Jesus says that, by the way, uh, it's the equivalent of us today saying infinity. Okay? So, uh, biblical numbers, seven and 70, anything in the seven is the number of perfection. In other words, 70 times seven is, we know literally is 490, but it is not 490 in spiritual terms. It's just infinity. Okay? So uh, even before Buzz Lightyear, Jesus was saying to infinity and beyond, right? <laughs> no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Easier said than done, right? It can be hard enough with one offense, let alone 490 or infinity. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. This ends the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to God. The first statement that's going to come out of my mouth is going to be controversial. We are not in a position to hold a grudge against someone who desperately needs our forgiveness. We, let me say it again. We are not in a position to hold a grudge against someone who desperately needs our forgiveness. I don't like this statement any more than you do. We feel empowered when we're first offended, right? We might not do this physically, but we let our hearts do this, right? Oh, you want a fight? I'll give you a fight, right? Right? When Jesus forgave us, he took the right to such a posture away from us. I have preached on this passage and other passages like this over the years and have almost always had at least one very annoyed listener confront this statement. I'm going to say it again, not to annoy you, but just... To, sometimes I think I'm saying it so many times to remind myself. 
we are not in a position to hold a grudge against someone who desperately needs our forgiveness. When Jesus forgave us, he took the right to such a posture away from us. A few years ago, someone approached me and was more than annoyed at such a prospect. And in fact, after the service, he said, you have never been so wrong in your life, Pastor John. By the way, I was kind of used to this person being right about everything and everybody else in the room was wrong about everything. So, but I took a big deep breath and I thought there are some things worth fighting for. And I looked at this person and I said, I asked him a question. Is it Christ's teaching or your opinion that declares that I am wrong? As a pastor, you, nobody likes to paint somebody into a corner, right? But that's exactly what I did. I wanted him to think. That's all he could think about was his opinion. And his opinion, and I know this because I struggle with these things too. You struggle. We all struggle with these things. Is it Christ's teaching or your opinion or my opinion that declares that I am wrong? I thought maybe it would be an open invitation. Um, by the way, I, he still, I, we still consider each other friends. Don't get me wrong. But he confessed to me, I like holding a grudge. And I said, but after a while, doesn't it start to eat you up from the inside out? It, you, it starts to be counteractive, right? It starts to destroy the very thing you're trying to hold together. Yes, but I like doing it. Well, I'll, everybody likes doing it up to a certain point, but at some point, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we, uh, we need to look to see what Christ did for us. Unforgiveness. We don't even have a very good English word. There's uh, unforgiveness. I don't even like that word, but, or holding a grudge, maybe. Just grudging or begrudging. Unforgiveness is spiritually destructive because, it, because it's contrary to God's will. It affects our emotions, our thoughts, our prayers, and our relationships. And the, the, the pain that unforgiveness leaves behind are the emotional wounds of rejection, fear, betrayal, and I believe it's the root of a lot of our insecurities. Such wounds, if not attended, if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to be our physician on these matters, will lead to deep-seated anger, resentment, and bitterness, which can be directly traced to the failure to forgive. We're prob I, I'm guessing that everybody here has an issue right now where they're working through forgiveness, right? Unless you're sitting in your sitting in your house and you got the doors all barred and you're not interacting, um, if we're out and about it, if we're living our lives as Christ has called us to, uh, we're probably in the process of learning how to forgive. And such a failure sneaks to the surface and rears its ugly head in our attitudes and behaviors. Um, I know when I get caustic, even when I get sarcastic sometimes, I go, oh, wait a second. It's kind of funny sometimes to have some sarcastic humor, but I'm always like, okay, and sometimes I have to ask other people, is there something behind that sarcasm? Sometimes it's a biting remark back. Um, or sometimes we're in the business of condemning, and all of it can be just downright nasty. Think about it. When Jesus' disciples asked him, how do we pray? One of the lines was, and forgive us our sins, our debts, or our trespasses, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. <laughs> I 
Do we really want to pray that? It does force the issue, doesn't it? Forgive us our sins, God. Yes, just like we've forgiven the sins committed against us. Oh, wait a second. I better get moving on that process of forgiveness that I'm dealing with right now. In fact, in Mark's gospel, Jesus speaks quite clearly to his disciples regarding forgiveness. It's not a parable. He just says, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen, and you have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. So Jesus is talking about prayer, praying in faith, right? It's not, oh Lord, I, um, when, I, when the service is done today, I want there to be a Mercedes Benz, all in gold, parked outside with the keys in it, with my name on the plate. Right? Right. <laughs> and here's Dave is saying, what church are you at? <laughs> That's not praying in the Father's will. That's praying in John's will, right? By the way, I don't want a Mercedes-Benz. I'm far too practical. Um, I couldn't afford the upkeep of a Mercedes-Benz, let alone <laughs> owning one. But it's praying according to the Father's will, right? Uh... So, so far, Jesus is talking about faith. And we usually say the opposite of faith is, is doubt, right? But Jesus says there's something that can so easily get in the way of our faith. Listen to what he says. But when you are praying... First, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins. Uh-oh. If I'm praying and I'm not repenting of my sins and I'm holding a grudge against somebody else who sinned against me, what Jesus is saying is God won't forgive me. God won't bless me. I'll hold it up until you learn, and I will be there when you learn. He says, but if you refuse to forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. That's Jesus teaching his disciples. That's us today. This isn't what the pastor wants to talk about. I don't even like it because it's hard work. Like you, sometimes there's power, especially when we've first been offended. Ugh! Right? It's a natural response. But God is telling us, I want to give you a supernatural response. Something that does not come easy to most, if not any of us. Jesus reminds us that when we allow unforgiveness to remain unresolved, when we hold on to a grudge and keep holding on to it, Holding on to grudge is like holding on to a container of acid. You know, it just eats through, and the next thing you know, it's all over our hands. We're burned. We build a barrier that not only gets between us and the person who may have offended us, but we also allow a barrier of disobedience to be raised up between ourselves and God. Unforgiveness keeps the pain of the offense very much alive. Not letting the wound heal. Going through life with a forever reminder of what was done to us. Consistently stirring the pain within us. Making us progressively angrier and angrier. Walking through life accumulating the baggage of bitter feelings. The writer of Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews 12, work at living in peace with everyone. Work at it. it in other words, it doesn't come easy. We've got to work at it. And work at living a holy life. I'll, 
A holy life doesn't mean that we all wear white robes and we levitate, you know, uh, a foot off the ground. Holy simply means set apart for the purposes of God. For those who are not holy, who are not set apart for the purposes of God, will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Now, in, our, in the Reformed Church, that is, if I could say that, probably, in a nutshell, the work of the church elder and the pastors, right? But it's not just limited to the pastor and the elders. It is for all of us. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. And then he writes, corrupting many. Right? There's a lie that sometimes we, if we're honest, we catch ourselves believing. I can deal with this bitterness by myself and it won't affect anybody else. Are you kidding me? It will affect everybody else. First, maybe subtly, and then later, not so subtly. It's not good for your health or my health individually, and it's definitely not good for the community of believers, the community of faith. So we are called to look around and keep a compassionate, care-filled eye on each other out of deep, deep concern. And by the way, if... If you ever find that you need to confront somebody, do it with the utmost of humility. Hey, I, brother, sister, I noticed, I noticed this. The reason I notice it is because I struggle with this too. Bring yourself into the picture of understanding, right? Out of humility. Out of humility. Notice the poisonous root of bitterness. <laughs> it troubles not only self, that's the lie we like to tell. Well, it's just my issue to deal with. Well, yeah, d deal with it. Um, or it will deal with you, and then it will in infect the whole community. Forgiveness is beneficial for everyone involved. For those who agree to live in community with both the one who forgives and the one who is forgiven. Unforgiveness acts like an infectious virus. It often starts out small in size and simple in composition, but grows when it is fed by living cells and once, that once were healthy but now are growing more diseased day by day. Doggone it, we just went through a pandemic, and I'm praying that we won't see one again anytime soon. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> Unforgiveness is also very contagious. And it can decimate a community within a short amount of time. Jesus knows all too well the powers of Satan's poisonous root of bitterness. Again, the author of Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews chapter 2, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that He should make Jesus, through His suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them, that's us today, his brothers and sisters. The Apostle Paul reminds us of the connection with being part of God's family and our deep need to forgive when he writes this. And By the way, um, I could almost quote this passage because I heard it from my mother um, 
either as she was preparing the meal or I was helping her clean the dishes after the meal growing up. I thought that she came up with this and then I read it in the Bible and realized, oh, my mom didn't come up with this. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. And this is what I heard from my mom a lot. So get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. She watched how I interacted with my four sisters and um, kept quoting me this passage. Instead, instead be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. It's Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. 4, 30, it's up on this. Thank you, Chris. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Sometimes I see the guys run and sound audio and video and I, and I can't help but think of the Wizard of Oz. The screen opens, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? Remember that line? <laughs> Ephesians 4, um, yeah, for the forgiving part is verse 32, but um, if you're a mom watching your kids, you know, just short of kill each other each day, um, I'd encourage you. And by the way, dads can do this too. And do not, by the way, as a parent, don't wait until you got it down perfectly to parent your children, right? In fact, it's helpful to say I'm sorry to your children too, right? Um, I, we ran out of water when I hiked uh, six hours to the top of a mountain in, in Arizona and six hours down. We ran out of water and I could have drank my tears because I, I hiked it with my two sons. It was a day or two after my oldest son got married. Um, and I asked them for forgiveness for all the times that I chose the church over them. And they both looked at me, Dad, you're being so hard on yourself. At the time we didn't understand it. Now we understand it. Oh, I'm trying not to tear up just thinking about those words. But I asked them for forgiveness for all the times I failed and, and put something else consistently in front of the needs that they had at the moment. Let me say it again, and I don't like saying this, but I, I, I need to hear it too. We are not in a position to hold a grudge against someone who desperately needs our forgiveness. When Jesus forgave us, he took it. He took that posture away from us. Did you know that some of the words that the Apostle Paul wrote and put in the letters, in fact, I'd love to do a series on this someday. Uh, we don't know the sources, but we know that they were not originally Paul's. Um, they're called the ancient hymns of the church. And sometimes Paul would quote the hymn book of the time. And everybody knew what he was quoting. Today we don't know the source of where those things... One of the hymns, one of the hymns goes like this, and you probably know it. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, to grasp. It's mine! No, he didn't do that. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges... He took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue, every tongue confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, teach us to love and forgive again as you love and forgave us. And you continue to love and forgive us today. No matter what we say, what we believe, or what we do, we are bankrupt without your love. Your love never gives up. It cares more for others than for self. It doesn't want what it doesn't have. It doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head. It doesn't force itself on others. Love, your love is not always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. Instead, it takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with a lot of nonsense. It trusts you, God, always, and always looks for the best, never looking back, but keeps going forward all to the way to the end and end a beginning with you. Amen. We now 